It's time for Mac Break Weekly. We have lots to talk about, including a FaceTime flaw that could let bad guys listen in on you. <laughs> Eavesdrop on you. The Apple earnings call is coming up. What to look for. And for want of a screw, a Mac Pro was almost lost. The New York Times story. All coming up next on Mac Break Weekly. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Mac Break Weekly, episode 646, recorded Tuesday, January 29th, 2019. The Taming of the Screw. Mac Break Weekly is brought to you by Sophos Cybersecurity. In an age of evolving cyber threats, you need evolved cybersecurity. Powered by artificial intelligence, Sophos can detect threats before they strike, killing ransomware, viruses, and other cyber threats dead in their tracks. Get a free security scan and or a free trial today at Sophos.com. And by ButcherBox. Better meat for a better you. Free from added antibiotics and hormones, humanely raised and delivered right to your door. For $20 off your first box and two pounds of free salmon, go to ButcherBox.com slash MacBreak and enter MacBreak at checkout. And by Aura Ring, the most accurate sleep and activity tracker ever. Visit AuraRing.com and use the code TWIT for $50 off your purchase. It's time for Mac Break Weekly, the show where we cover the latest Apple news. And it's always so much fun to get together with my close Apple friends, people like Renee Ritchie from iMore.com. Hello, Renee. Hey, Leo. I didn't answer this, but you're still seeing my mic and my video, so I'm very concerned. Oh, is that a problem? <laughs> uh, I guess we'll get to that, yes. Okay. Oh, 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 we're talking about FaceTime. Yeah, I've been listening in, Renee. Shame <laughs> on you. Shame on you. We'll get to I that. I love Roger Whitaker, and I will not apologize. <laughs> There's a ship lies safe and ready in the... Andy Yanatko is also here from WGBH, Boston Public Radio. Great to see you, Andrew. <laughs> Great to see you. It sounds like Renee has things to hide. I mean, that's <laughs> I, I've got. I have no problem being surveilled by every my, device that I have. That's why I chose Android to begin gold with. Collection, sir. <laughs> and it's, it's, sorry, and, I was going to pick something funny. Go ahead. And I well, we can't leave Lori Gill out. The <laughs> wonderful Lori Gill, managing editor of I More, is here Thank as well, you. filling I'm in back. for Alex Lindsay. And frankly, Alex can never come back again. <laughs> Don't tell him that. We've replaced you, Alex. Lori has got the hair. That's true. You might be listening in on, on our our FaceTime calls right now and hearing you say oh! that. So what so let's talk oh. about that because that was that was obviously the story of the day. Uh somebody tweeted, uh, I think it was yesterday. Oh, look, when you use Apple's FaceTime group calling feature, if you add yourself to the group, call somebody, answer the call, because anybody in the group can answer the call. You can listen in and to to the person on the other end, and in fact, you can even do it in video. Yeah, I mean that's kind of yeah. a big deal. Actually, I think um, there's another it's... tweet that popped up on the tweet feeds. Um, MGT seven uh, nine days ago actually tweeted this a similar thing. Ooh. I don't think it was as 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 well described, but it says, uh, my teen found a major security flaw in Apple's new iOS. He can listen into your iPhone or iPad without your approval. I have video, submitted a bug report to Apple support, waiting to hear back to provide details, scary stuff. So that's so, uh, the big, that's the big question because the person who tweeted it didn't follow what is normally done in, in security circles, which is this responsible um, notification where you tell the company you give them 90 days to fix it then you make it public if they don't it they it's like a zero day they just went out and yeah told no everybody. human knows that though that's, that's the problem and that's yeah. the real and that's what i pointed out immediately is they're not secure yeah. whoever found this wasn't a security researcher so they just said look what i can do nine to five mac verified it and apple responded to their credit very quickly they disabled group facetime actually they disabled all facetime right they cut it well they cut just, it so um they cut it. Initially, they just said that we're going to fix this within a few days. And people get concerned, like, why not immediately? Because you always want to test the fix, because if it's a bad fix, it could be worse than no fix at all. So it takes them a couple of days to QA it, and then they release it. But that this was bug was so bad, they actually went in and shut down the FaceTime group 
server, which is a separate server from the original FaceTime server. So you can still FaceTime one on one, but you can't you can't connect more than one person anymore, which means you can't use this bug anymore. It's funny. This uh, MGT seventy five hundred said he reported the news to Fox News <laughs> eight days yeah, ago. It's so weird. There are people looking into this because the account like like just just arrived oh. and it had some weird tweets, and oh. then it tweeted this. And then, and there's we like when you look at the email they claim that Apple sent, it's broken with no sort of hyphenation. It's yeah. the, the, so it could be that it got lost because Apple Apple used to only like it hit the Wall Street Journal that would get Apple to reply. Now Apple replies when it hits nine to five Mac, which is great. But it's still if you're just on a social network somewhere and you're one of hundreds of millions of people tweeting at Apple, Apple support, there's still no good way to to sort of filter out and find the really important stuff and get that to Apple's red teams, you know, in order for because like you could tell the minute this hit nine to five Mac, there was like everything yeah. at Apple stopped. But right. no, nothing happened when that original <laughs> tweet went out. Nobody saw it. Yeah, and you know it was January twentieth. Isn't that long ago? And uh, well, that, that that's not that's not the day it was discovered. That's the that's the, that's the first time that somebody who was aware of this decided to post it to a public forum. Every time you see ah, that, we know that's like this, a good point. You fi you figure that's been it's been in the field for a long, long time, and there are a lot right. of people. It's 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 like the it's like the Coke machine that's giving you two cokes for every time you put in one dollar. Nobody's telling nobody to fix that thing. Yeah. People are rather people who want their free code. So the the good news is, as as we've already said, but I'll say it one more time, Apple's going to fix this post haste probably this week. Uh, but uh, until then, they've disabled the feature that allowed it. Yeah. So it you, you don't have it's not something anybody could worry should worry about today. Well, well and you don't I, have to do anything. That's important to point out. Like people were going a little bit like scared yesterday and turning off FaceTime or putting on Do Not Disturb mode and potentially missing other calls or trying to hang up really quickly and and so like. It's terrible. You can be super angry about it, but it, it took a while also. When Apple shut off the servers, it took a while for it to propagate so that all the servers were shut down. But as of right now, I haven't seen any more reports of anyone successfully doing a group FaceTime call. So at least but, that part of it, you you don't have to worry yeah. about now. I um, I urge greater caution. That's just my personal thing uh, because a, a, a Apple says that they're going to have a bug fix in a few days. So you, if you can do without FaceTime, I think it's a good idea to turn it off only because you know that as soon as this this thing went wide, not everybody who wasn't aware of it is now really pounding on FaceTime to look for any other exploits they can do based on this bug. So uh, I would again, if I if I can deal without uh, FaceTime for a few days, I would it's I, I would not assume that the gun a, any gun is unloaded, uh, and I would do without it for a few days because again I'm I'm uh, I, 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 I'm uh, I, yeah go ahead. So when did this Renee? When did it become act? Say, when did it become active? It this well, was one, one quick thing I wanted to add is yeah. that if if you like depend on sign language or you're traveling and you want right, to see your exactly. bit like. There, there are use cases that you might want. Like in general, yeah, if you don't need to turn it off, but if you do depend on sign language or you need to see something or you need to do something, I, I, the threat level of this is considerably smaller than it was last night. Yeah, right. Again, I, right. I agree with Renee. If you, if you need FaceTime, use it. If you don't need it, I would again. My advice is to turn it off for a few days. That's not uh, that's not as bad as it might have been like last week, which was only, for God's sakes. Until Apple responds to this, do not have, put put it put your phone in your sock drawer and leave it on. When did this uh, become uh, possible? Well, only when they turned on group FaceTime, right? Which was not so long ago. Yeah. And we don't know because, like, you know, to Andy's point, we don't know when. It, like this, Lori mentioned an earlier discovery. There might have been early discoveries we'll find on some Facebook page one day. Mm -hmm. And there could be people who found it and never reported it. So we, we won't know exactly when right. it went live. It had to have been sometime after 12.1 ship because that's when FaceTime groups went live for everybody. Uh, it, we don't know if it was in that original version. We, we might have to have someone, you know, and you can't even test it now because if you have the old version. Right. Uh, but it was yeah. sometime after, when did that say? Like, uh, December, I think, November, December. How does something like this get through? I mean, is this a difficult bug to discover? No, it's just, you know, again, when you have software at this scale, it, it, it's stupid and somebody should have found it in testing. And maybe it didn't exist in the early versions when they tested it and they made a, a bug fix to something else. And the latest update yeah. that went out a week ago or something included it. It's just the complexity level of the stuff increases. There's no such thing as perfect code. There's always mistakes that happen in it. And sometimes also, you know, Apple Apple does beta test this stuff and nobody found it in the beta tests uh, either, either, or at least nobody yeah. disclosed it when they yeah. found it in the beta test either. So the public had access to this as well. It's just something that's stupefyingly like OpenSSL and a bunch of other stuff that you just, you cannot Bugs believe. always are surprising. It. You know, that, and yeah. that, every 
Everything has bugs. There's no perfect software ever. Hope yeah. King had a great line yet last night where she said there, there's two kinds. There's two kinds of bugs. Ones that ones that you found and ones you haven't found. There's right. just no such thing. As <laughs> right. <Yeah. laughs> there's no perfect yeah, software. And, and I everything think is like, right. What's kind of funny to me is we're we're up in arms about the fact that this privacy thing that you know there's this way that somebody can listen in on our conversations for the 10 seconds before we hang the hang up on them after they've called us and what a big deal is this and how did apple let this happen and how come they haven't addressed it sooner but we all allow all these other companies to literally create digital versions of ourselves and we don't have a problem with that they might as well be listening in on our conversations with as much data as they've gathered about us why is it such a big deal that an accident happened that is now being fixed when we're not addressing like this larger well, issue of what Lori, other you would think it's a big doing. deal if you know what I heard last night on your phone. <laughs> you heard me. It was, yeah. it was October 30th. <laughs> I mean, it just, it just uh, well, I mean, to, uh, to, to her point, it's, it's, uh, it's it's an awareness this... that it, it's it's awareness that uh, every device has sensors on it that can be activated without your knowledge if a yeah. bad operator or a bad piece of software uh, is acting against your best interests. Uh, this is it, it is a big deal because uh, Apple uh, Apple and other companies that are creating this infrastructure are required, I think, morally to make sure that this infrastructure is safe so that when a bug like this does occur, that's a really, really big abrogation of responsibility. The other problem is that this, this is why I really winced when I saw that huge billboard at CES. What happens on your app on your iPhone? Yeah. This is punishment for hubris, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. exactly. And 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 I, and I realized that the, the, the I, I realized that the sign was talking about uh, actual physical data collection by by Google and other companies, not about security bugs. But that's you really are trying to say that. Oh, but by the way, we are our, our security is so good that there is no bug or no exploit that we haven't already found and quashed again. It's like that's why you have to really be sure. But yeah, there's this hubris. That is that is like <laughs> that God is like saying, "Say, hey, St. Peter, watch this." <laughs> I also should the sun. also. Uh, should issue a apologia for last week where I was ragging on Apple because uh, they forced you to use Google and search and Safari. And many, many have pointed out to me that you can go into uh, the search settings in Safari and uh, make it be DuckDuckGo or Bing or Yahoo if you want, if you don't want to use Google. Although my point still stands, Google's the default. Most people yeah. will never change it. But so, so yeah, I assume people knew that, but the, the default, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I didn't know it. I guess I might have known it in the past that's the problem there's so many settings these days and modern devices yeah. you you forget what's there so yeah in fact people tend to use the default so yeah. i mean the point i think the point is still if fair. you care you can it's going to cost apple a micro cent but you can turn your <laughs> turn your default search to something else including duck duck go um let's but just one Go ahead. One last thing I just, I just wanted to back up, Renee, in, in defense of Apple. The 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 amount of things that you you are building software on shifting sands. You build, you change one thing and it's to and it's to fix a critical bug. You really have no idea what other parts of the system have been affected by that bug bug fix until you then retest everything all over again. It really is like running an Apollo mission, shifting, uh, uh, creating even the simplest piece of software. So I, I this this probably shouldn't be used as an argument argument that uh, oh see apple's lost its magic see this sort of thing never used to happen not. when steve yeah. jobs was no. in was in business but yeah, again, they had some terrible bugs system. then too yeah <clears throat> again the, the the losing everything on losing everything on your hard drive that was a that was also a major bug <laughs> after after a system update <laughs> yeah. uh, i would i would i would say that perhaps it was also a, a big bug well, they but once... it's, it's, it's 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 one more reminder that that's why i don't like Apple fandom, just like I don't like Google fandom. I know there is no such thing as Facebook fandom, but uh, remember <laughs> that this company, that this, it's this, the HP this company fanboys, is, Andy. Yeah, <laughs> it's, <laughs> hey, I, you know, I, I still have my compact Presario. It still runs, Me too. <laughs> runs, runs Minesweeper. I have my really Jornada. <laughs> uh, but I'm, I'm just saying this. This is this is why if you're building this idea of your mind that we're using Apple hardware, and again, I'm running on an Apple uh, on an Apple right here. I use an iPad every day. Uh, I grew up with Apple II's, and really, as a little kid, kind of as having little kid fantasies about how cool Apple is. 
uh, this sort of fan worship is counterproductive to both Apple and yourself. They are mortals doing a really, really tough job. Uh, and for every crisis that we that bubbles to the surface and becomes a trending topic on Twitter, there are a hundred that they catch just in time. Uh, and so they are mortals. These things happen. The only question is, how do they respond to it? And the fact that they responded yeah. to 95 Mac very quickly and also didn't leave people hanging saying, we are aware of the problem and are investigating the issue. It was very quick to say, we got the bug fix. It's going to be deploying uh, by the end of this week. <laughs> Hopefully they'll have more to say about it. Uh, I wonder what people are going to be talking to, asking Tim Cook about during the, during the call today. Uh, <laughs> well, that's my next story. Let me move on. Yeah. Let's well, the one thing, this. There's one thing done? I just want to okay. add. There's, uh, and it made a really good point. is how the companies respond, but it's also how the companies architect. And if they make sure that the architecture is you know, encrypted, for example, if someone breaks in, all they get is pseudo-random junk. They don't get your data. If they mm -hmm. make, So there's a lot companies can do to minimize their footprint once they are uh, compromised, and then also it's how they respond once they're compromised. This is the day Apple gives uh, its quarterly results. These are the results that uh, Tim already uh, warned people won't be as good as we had hoped. Uh, I know, Renee, in fact, I, one of the reasons I'd like everybody to be a little bit shorter in their responses, we want to get Renee out oh, in sorry. time. <laughs> <laughs> it's not you I'm talking about, Renee. We want to be, get people, uh, Renee, out in time because he's got work to do. Mr. Although, Chief. Lori, you do too, right? You're gonna. Are you the transcriptionist this time? Oh, God, no. Oh, good. <laughs> no, our, our wonderful, <laughs> wonderful helper, our wonderful friend, Micah Sargent, is going to be taking care oh, of Oh, Micah took over from Serenity, huh? All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> He's, he does a much, much better job than so, I could even pretend to do. So that's usually around, uh, it's after the market closes, so... Uh, the press release is 4.30, the conference call is 5. Okay. So and that's Pacific time, 3 p.m. <laughs> we'll try to get out by then. I think we will be. I don't. I wouldn't worry about it. You've got actually two p.m. Pacific time, right? Yeah, two p.m. Yeah, you got oh, some. Yeah. You got some writing to do. All right, we're gonna. Uh, <laughs> we'll we'll talk about what to expect. We also have uh, the annual Six Colors report card uh, on Apple, and of course, next week we'll be doing the quarterly Six Colors graphs. Thanks to <laughs> Jason Snell and a tiny screw that shows you why iPhones. <laughs> Cannot be assembled in the United States. A great story from the New York Times about the trash can Mac Pro. But first, a word about your security. As long as we're talking, bugs happen. And this is a day and age where some of the bad guys are uh, getting smarter and smarter. So you need to get smarter and smarter in protecting yourself. And there's a name uh, everybody knows. Uh, certainly, if you ever listen to Security Now, we talk about Sophos all the time. We, in fact, use Sophos gear here to protect ourselves at Twit. It has the best technology, AI technology. They use deep learning. This is this is how this is how far it's gotten with bad guys. You know, it's always been a seesaw battle. Sophos is now applying the latest state of the art deep learning technology to learn how bad guys work and protect you and this way they can respond to threats faster than any antivirus can. We are fans of so Sophos. We use their UTMs. We use their software. Sophos recently ranked, ranked number one by an independent security test from SE Labs, the best protection rating across the board for both large enterprises and small business. And now, and here's the good news and the reason why you might be interested in this, they took this technology, already protecting millions of business users, and made a premium version available for home users, for Macs as well as for PCs. It's called Sophos Home. And you know, I'm not a fan of antiviruses, but this is different. This is real-time protection from the latest ransomware attacks, malicious software, from phishing, hacking of all kinds. It's very easy to use, and it's always up-to-date. It's always learning, and it's always smarter. If you're just securing your own laptop or managing multiple devices in your home, or as, as with Twit, many devices all around the world, you can sign up for a single account and protect every Mac and PC in your home from one console. I really like that. And because it's cloud-based, you can even use it to keep your relatives secure. I'm putting it on my mom's Mac, even though she's thousands of miles away, so I can remote, remotely manage her security, clean up threats, keep the systems safe. You may know Sophos' tagline is security made simple. And, and of course, that, that's true, true for Sophos Home. You log in from your browser, and, and it's easy to use, and you start securing your systems today. This is the right way to do it. Whether you're a home user or a large enterprise, Sophos has you covered. Third-party reviewers consistently rank Sophos among the best cybersecurity providers. 
And I love this synchronized security, which means you can manage all your products from a single cloud-based console, even remote relatives. You want to try it? Free trial today. And of course, uh, and I've recommended this many times, they also have a free security scan, Sophos, S-O-P-H-O-S dot com. Next generation protection for your home. Sophos dot com. We are fans. So, what do we expect? We already know because uh, Cook issued that guidance a couple of weeks ago that it was not going to be the bounty that uh, Apple had thought um, this quarter. Uh, he downgraded it to $84 billion yeah. uh, revenue instead of as much as 92 to $94 billion. So what do, what do, we, what do we think? Was that a facepalm graphic or just a headache graphic? <laughs> that is a, this is a picture of a, of a non-existent thing, which is a guy in a blue jacket on the New York Stock Exchange trading floor. But really, as far as I know, according to Flash Boys, there's nothing going on in the trading floor. That's just photo op stuff because uh, it's all done by shading, computers now. He's shading his eyes from the brightness of the Stock Exchange. <laughs> from all the photographer's flashes. So... Um, I, you yeah, know, we, um, we're a show yeah. about Mac for about and for Mac users, but an app and iPhone and iOS users. But uh, I think some of this does, you know, give us information about how Apple's doing and where Apple's going. Right. It's going to be the second most profitable quarter in the history of Apple. And it's going to be a huge disappointment to everyone inside <laughs> and outside of Apple. And pathetic? both these things can <laughs> be true. Uh, because it, it, I mean, it, it hints at the great fear we've had the commoditization of desktop computers for a while, and now it looks like we've reached the saturationing of the smartphone market. And the iPhone was so profitable for so long; it made so much money. It was the best consumer electronics business, maybe the best business we've seen <laughs> in modern times. And it looks like it's reached its pinnacle, and we we have a hard time adjusting to that, Leo. It's, yeah, it's it's also telling that this is uh, that this is the, is this the first uh, quarter in which they are not going to be saying here are many units we shipped. Yes. Uh, for for, for obviously yeah. So so we're not going to get that data anymore. Instead, they're focusing on here's how much money we're making per here's here's our profitability per product line per user, which makes sense because now they can sort of shift focus a little bit away from the declining smartphone business, which is affecting everybody, and towards here's how much money we're making on services, uh, which is. Something Something that we weren't making any money whatsoever on really over the past five or ten years, and now we're ma we're making this into a boom booming business. Hey, look at these deals we've signed at Sundance this week, uh, which also point to what a great uh, push we're putting into uh, things that are not necessarily iPhone. Uh, and they they can also sort of fall back on why why are they why are they falling short of their predictions? Again, they really laid, they really laid the groundwork for this with that letter uh, earlier this year by saying that essentially that they thought that the Chinese economy would continue to go the way it's going. The economy is kind of starting to show signs of being in trouble, so there's a lot less confidence in buying high-end luxury items. They're also having a, a worse time than they thought getting into other markets like India, uh, as we've been talking about for the past uh, couple of years now. Uh, Apple's success with the iPhone is starting to hinge upon selling iPhones to people who have not been buying iPhones previously uh, and that's a that's a much harder thing for them to do they're really good at making extremely well-made luxury type items that have a lot of sort of umami to them they're not really good <laughs> at selling you the sort of like all-weather radial tires that everybody puts on their car as opposed to the high performance fast and the furious sort of stuff so they're gonna they're, they'll they'll get through this again there's there's a lot of new flash cards for tim about the uh, about this bug that's that's coming out but they're gonna they, they have a lot to talk about and it's not going to be as dire as maybe uh, pundits can talk about well, Andy, you just said everything. I'll, I'll see you guys later because that, that's all <laughs> well, I was to say about that. But, but I imagine, Lori, <laughs> uh, you and everybody who's covering this will go with a kind of a checklist of things you're going to be listening for. Yeah. Always, yes. Like what? Yes. Um, probably what Apple is going to say about um, it's, it's what's going on with China. I think that... It, the investor um, meetings for years now have kind of had a heavy focus on Apple's um, sort of 
jump into China and and how how much money it's making, how well it's doing. So there's going to be a lot of talk about that. There's going to not just addressing the actual sort of lowering of the numbers, but a, a general sense of so so what now? Because this has been Apple's not focus, but it's been an important issue that they've talked about for quite a few years. So this will definitely need to be kind of addressed for the investors and and they're they're going to need to know how are you going to fix this basically how are you going to make it better in the chinese market now that you know that it's not as as booming as as it was before and and the saturation level has been hit what do you do going forward and then that kind of goes back to what andy is saying about services so i'll definitely be listening for any hints or any um discussion about services cuz obviously they're they're kind of they're trying to work toward showing the the larger picture of the profits that they're making instead of the the per unit iPhone sales. They're saying we're we're not selling as many iPhones, but our revenue is larger. So pay attention, pay more attention to our revenue and less attention to our per unit sales, which makes complete sense for a company to want to do that something. That could actually like that. backfire on them because if people aren't looking at inventory numbers, <laughs> they're going to look more closely at other numbers and maybe even more speculatively at other numbers. One thing people are watching for is App Store sales. With Netflix pulling out, uh, mm -hmm. App Store, which is one of the big contributors to services, may not be uh, as valuable as they have been in the past. Yeah, and um, <laughs> that... subscriptions of things, are, are it's definitely something to... It, it's it, that's a a bad place to put all your eggs because the the market like our personal taste and things change constantly. So you know one year thousands of people might subscribe to one service and then the next year everyone dumps that service and moves on to a different one or a completely different way of doing something. So using subscription as your sort of how much money we're making comes off of subscription is definitely a bad idea. And the the Netflix example is a perfect. Netflix is huge and and they brought a lot of money into iTunes to Apple and they're not going to do that anymore. So that's a huge amount of revenue that's being lost for them and if all companies decided that they were going to pull out of the through iTunes subscription model, that's a lot of money for Apple to lose. So it's certainly a bad idea to focus heavily on how much how much money that you can generate from subscriptions and kind of like digging in on that. It's better to, I think what Apple is, you know, what we're hearing is that they're trying to create their own services that um, people will want to subscribe to. And we'll probably be seeing a lot of that in the next year or two. Renee, what are you, what are you looking at this afternoon? Uh, when you listen. Uh, next quarter's guidance is going to be one, you know, it's traditionally not a very good quarter for Apple coming off the holidays, but this is the big quarter, any right? sort of this quarter. Yeah, this is a big quarter. And again, it's going to be the second most valuable quarter in Apple's history, which is more money than any other company in the world is is making, but it, it, people really care about the momentum, the growth. Is it is it accelerating or is it declining? And it doesn't matter how much money you're making if you're not going to make more money tomorrow. So that's that's a key indicator. Um, and there's also a lot of questions like, yeah, Netflix is leaving the App Store, but Apple is heavily invested in, or the App Store is is heavily carried by in-app purchases in video games. And we've seen Fortnite try to pull out, you know, Fortnite has pulled out of the Android Store. Is that going to be a trend too? There was rumors just yesterday that Apple might go into the subscription gaming business because, you know, who knows how long people are going to be willing to just shovel endless amounts of of whale-like money into video games. So the subscription thing is going to be very interesting with rumors of the TV service, the magazine, IO, the latest iOS beta has Apple News for Canada, which is great news, but it also has hints of this Apple Premium News subscription service. Uh, and there's a lot more things like that. If you start adding the, the news service to the television service, the existing Apple Music service, to a games um, subscription service, they'll have to figure out a bundle so that we don't get subscription fatigue or subscription creep out of it. Uh, but there's a lot of room for them to play. And as Tim Cook pointed out, even though there's a lot of bad news in China, Apple's services revenue in China was actually up. And this is a country where people believe that nobody pays for anything, yet people are choosing to pay for Apple stuff. And that's probably the silver lining we can pull out of this. Yeah, you know, remember that we're talking about when we're talking about an earnings call. We're talking about what investors are concerned about, and they're concerned. What they're concerned about is very, very sensible to the point of view of investors. Uh, as consumers, we don't care that Apple is making more money every single year, so long as they uh, continue to a stay in business and also be able to control their own destiny. Investors are concerned about. We need to, we 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 put we put our money in Apple not because we love our iPhones but because we keep getting more money back. 
Uh, and so make sure you, you always have to partition on a day like this the difference between stuff that is affecting your portfolio or your 401k and stuff that is simply affecting what your phone will be able to do in the next five years. Will um, Apple say anything about their streaming service? The information is reporting that it will be a spring launch. They won't they will, say anything, but they never talk about things like that. Investor calls and they say, we no. don't, we don't comment on things that we're working on. So yeah, yeah. they won't mention it. Lori is absolutely right. They'll probably say we have some exciting new products that we will be introducing in the second quarter. Probably we'll hear. Which could be air, the air power or new <laughs> AirPods or um, new t uh, t t new t-shirts that would have been loop. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Does Apple, uh, <clears throat> Renee, never say anything? Any very, announcements? Very, very rarely. I could count on half a hand how often they've sort of pre-announced that. And it's always been incredibly strategic. Like Steve would drop by and right. join Tim on the call or <laughs> right. something. Right. And then they would they would may, they would maybe tell you when OS X was shipping, which they'd never said before uh, or something like that. But it's never been a major, it's not the right platform for a major product announcement. Um, it's possible. I mean, Tim Cook has two exceptions. He will talk about AR and he will talk about autonomous technologies. And we just had news about Titan Project. So it's possible that one of the invest, one of the analysts will ask something about Apple's autonomous future. And Tim Cook will, will say, you know, it's great technology. It's the mother of all AI projects projects and sort of give his stock quote on that but that, i just think that's as far as we'll probably get in terms of future looking statements the on new, Apple the products. news was that uh, project titan their uh, autonomous vehicle project had laid off 200 of its employees yeah. that they which were as Gruber pointed out is it was it, they reassigned them they're leaving titan yeah. and they're going to other areas in ai at apple right yeah also that also that doesn't necessarily mean that apple is losing faith in project titan it means that like all almost all companies that are developing autonomous technology they are doing the research to figure out what product they eventually want to make and now they're getting closer and closer to figuring out okay we don't want to build or maybe we don't want to build our own car we don't even now we don't even want to build a black box that goes in other cars now we really want to just build server software that helps over 5g other cars uh, uh, derive themselves correctly so that doesn't say anything necessarily yeah um yeah it's in fact there was new management at the uh, at project titan which also could just be related to that i mean that's not an unusual thing yeah well i mean like i've made this point before but can you imagine if we had the news organization we have today when the iphone was first coming out it'd be like oh oh p1 someone has left the p1 team and joined the p2 team right. oh there's controversy fidel is fighting right. with scott forrestal oh no one of them <laughs> i mean it would have been a completely different experience would it would have been a lot more fun though? <laughs> yes, they yeah, all I smell miss like those pizza. Days. They all smell like pizza. <laughs> What's going on? Uh, so, what about this rumor that Apple might be planning? A, this comes from Cheddar, an unusual source for Apple scoops. <laughs> <clears throat> Cheddar is a, I think, a television network, right? They do it's a streaming network, streaming yeah, network, yeah. financial yeah. network. Uh, Apple's planning a subscription service for games. Cheddar says, according to five people familiar with the matter, they uh, apparently started approaching developers. Uh, last year, discussing a subscription service, Megan and I talked about this on iOS Today. We were puzzled because uh, while there are subscription services for gaming, Microsoft's uh, Game Pass, for instance, 100 bucks a year, and you get unlimited access to a large number of titles, including some uh, uh, A-list titles. Yeah. Uh, and so it's about a one and a half game, the cost about one and a half games a year. But games on iOS... Is it on iOS? Games on iOS, five, ten dollars. What what could they charge for a subscription it's service that would make sense? Video. It's turning it's turning off the IAPs. That's a big deal for that stuff. You you get the full version of the game. They don't microcharge you. They don't charge you for upgrades for extra levels. You actually get to play. And some of these games have been so destroyed by microtransactions. Not looking at Electronic Arts so closely, but damn, Electronic Arts, you've ruined a lot of games. <laughs> and they're just not fun anymore. They're horrible, horrible experiences that people get addicted to but don't really enjoy. And if you could alleviate, if you could give, and this is a terrible example, but if you could say, hey, this is the Nintendo Club on Apple TV. You pay 100 bucks a year and you buy the Nintendo MFI controller and you have access to everything up to the N64 games, uh, or you have a bunch of Apple developer games and you have access to all of these things and there's no IEPs, there's no upgrade purchases, there's no extra level packs, you just get full access to these games. That might be compelling for people who surprisingly really love games. Yeah, I mean, if you if you compare, if you think about this in the larger ecosystem of, oh, no, no now they're going to be competing with like NVIDIA streaming platform, or they're going to be competing with Google's Project Stream, which will put full board uh, PC titles in any Chrome browser. 
uh, that's a bad and maybe a weird idea. But when you think about the uh, the iOS game ecosystem as its own self-contained market, as its own individual platform, and when you think about how worried every single parent is about their kid somehow getting access to their fingerprint or their passcode and racking up enormous amounts of charges for these pay-to-play games, uh, the idea of saying, well, what if we just give <laughs> give the what if we just pay ten bucks a month and we will let the kid download any app that works with the subscription model they can play forever and will only cost us 10 bucks a month that's a really compelling thing to uh, to tell parents especially considering really? never 10 bucks a again. month no it will no. never bother us again no you, kid, you don't have kids i would no I, that's ridiculous maybe a buck a month 10 you bucks a you, month you, you you bought your kid an 800 dollar phone <laughs> okay can i just say that can i, can I just say that's how the point it was i bought my kid an 800 dollar phone he should be happy Stop now. <laughs> Dad, I need your password again. I ran out of Smurf berries. Dad, I need your password well, that's again. Why, I ran right. out of Pokeballs. But that's Dad, right. I need your that's why you don't again. do it. That's why, well, maybe Dad, I'm I just, wrong. I, don't, I, just, I, just get, I just get so bored when I'm spending my weekend at, at mom's house and there's no games to play. And gosh, and, you know, she just makes me do my homework and makes me do yard work. And when learn. I'm at, so do you yeah. think it'll be 10 bucks a month? Because that seems to me. I don't, I don't know. I'm, I, was just, I was just using that as an example. I, what, what, but that's but my but point is what could you charge that would and make economic music sense? Is a month. Is it, but that, it, there's, a, there's always been a problem with the cost of apps and games in the app store is that they're always underpriced. These, these developers work really hard on their projects and they have to charge 99 cents right. in order to get to buy them and they excuse me and um not making enough money on it so maybe this is a way for apple to charge a lot and then these developers to get more than just 99 cents one time for their apps and there will be a le like less of that in-app purchase type gaming going on because the the, the game developers that i've talked to in, in my entire time of covering apple stuff is that um going the in-app purchase route a lot of game developers don't even like those types of games, but they know that that's the only way that they can make enough money to get to the next game or to, you know, keep the lights on. So they do those in-app purchase games, but they would prefer a one-time buy, but they can't charge you even $10 for a game um, without an uproar from from the, the buyers of these games because we're used to 99-cent games. It was right out of the gate. It was a bad idea for games to be so cheap, and now there's no way out of it. Maybe this is a way out of it for game developers to be able to raise the price of their games or participate in Apple's subscription base so that they can just kind of get a little bit more for their game than they get now. Well, I can see why it's good for developers in Apple. I don't see the value proposition to users at all. But if you're <laughs> well, if you know that you're getting quality and that you're not no, getting tricked into the into the why game do you think freemium works? <laughs> people are because because, because people, people don't want to pay up front, but they'll pay for ego or for instant gratification. Right. Yeah, exactly. Right. So if you if So you, you're asking me to pay up front sight unseen a, a monthly fee for I don't even know what the game is. Well, you do it for Netflix though, Leo. That's pretty different. I honestly don't think that for that's some comparable. people it's not. But is it for a kid? <laughs> you do I pay I pay Microsoft's Game Pass. Uh it's well worth it. But th but those are A level games that cost sixty bucks. Triple mm. A games. I, I I I look at the games on uh an iPad and wonder what would I be willing to pay a monthly fee of any kind? Let let alone Fortnite has dollars. controller well, support uh, now. Fortnite's Leo. You could free. Be flossing. <laughs> Fortnite's you could free. Be flossing. Yeah, you but, pay uh, for but flossing, but Fortnite's free. I, I I see it in the in the other direction. I don't I, I don't see a whole lot of games on the on the iPad on on iOS that are those these sort of I'm going to enjoy for the next two weeks. Uh, playing this game and getting really involved in this world, I'm seeing lots of little games that people just enjoy, just sort of like fast twitching to for a long time, or strategy games that it's not a big world that requires uh, staffs of thousands of people in order to populate. Uh, this is the, it seems to me as though this is this is an okay value for simply saying instead of you having to to give someone a dollar here, two dollars there, three dollars there. All you can eat for all these nice, smaller, more compact games uh, that you will sort of use and discard over the next uh, several days to a couple of weeks. 
it's it, it's an okay, it's it's an interesting proposition for Apple. And also remember that uh, when you any subscription service is essentially we get to essentially we're charging for electrons and air, uh, and electrons and air are everywhere. My my house is full of them. Uh, and to be able to charge for them instead of something you have to manufacture and source tiny obscure screws for, <laughs> that's always an, an opportunity for Apple to get into in both feet. What if uh, the Cheddar story is a little bit misguided because they only talked to five developers? Apple talked to them last year because, of course, developers. You well, know. Also, let's, let's what if also it's not just? That, wait a minute. Let me finish my thought. Go ahead. What, sorry. what if it's what if it's not just games? I mean, I could I would pay ten bucks a month for unlimited app access. I, I just I, I'm sorry to interrupt. I, I just wanted to quickly point out parenthetically that you're I'm always a little bit suspicious of one of these interesting news items about Apple that happens right before the earnings call. Yeah. It makes me wonder if maybe someone at Apple said we need to distract some attention away uh, from something that we know that's in the field. Uh, maybe that's, so that's, that's all I want to say. Yeah, but I shouldn't. Yeah, no, no, no. Maybe that's it. Yeah, and and what you're saying is definitely possible that like the conversations could have been old or. Um, they were all, they were, the, according to Cheddar from uh, summer last of 2018, summer of last year. Mm -hmm. So but, but maybe it, Apple it, it was thinking be, about it and didn't, you know, there's yeah. no reason that they might not have conversations on all, all kinds of things. So right. it, this could be just a thing. Let's let's pitch this idea. Let's see right. what developers think. Nah, let's not and move on. Right. It could be just like that. Yeah. Well, that, if that, you're going to have a range of subscription services, if you're going to have Apple Music and Apple Television and Apple Magazines and, you know, in, in the future other services, having Apple Games is not the worst thing to include in your in your a la carte or in your bundle. Is it impossible to do it's, all apps? No, Amazon no. had all apps and there is, you know, there's the I forget the name of that service on the Mac that has a, a ton of different apps. It's just the value proposition is really different. It, it sometimes somehow mentally you make it like Apps sort of get, get Netflix is investigating game downloads as part of their next their next uh, flex subscription. It just full it folds into that entertainment bucket, and right. people have proven that they'll That's pay easier. for entertainment what they won't always yeah. pay for other stuff. Actually, yeah. if you uh, if you did camera apps, I would pay for that. <laughs> I spent a lot of money on camera apps and filters and all that stuff. So maybe maybe games is. But enough. subscriptions are it, it's uh, they, you have two problems. One is you have subscription fatigue, or people are like every app is mm -hmm. becoming subscription, and I just can't take it anymore. And you have subscription creep, where it's like every app is going to subscription, and I can't pay eighty bucks a month right. for the apps that I used to buy once. And you know everyone's saying that that uh, subscriptions are the next big thing, which is what they said about in-app purchases before people got tired of those. And the real problem is that we haven't found a way to support developers to make the apps that we want. We all want these boutique craft nice apps, but the only people who can afford to make apps really now are the ones that use data or hardware like Apple or Google to subsidize their 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 creation. Yeah. And we haven't come to terms with being willing to pay for the apps that we want. So we're going to get less and less of them. Apple uh, does have some culpability for bringing the value, the price of apps down uh, on iOS. Only by right? making a store. It would have, if it wasn't Apple, it would have been somebody else. Any any craft when it hits mainstream, when you start, like they were a niche. There were so few apps. They were so expensive. It was Office. It was Photoshop. But as soon as access becomes ubiquitous, as soon as people realize now I have access to 3,000 apps, I only used to have access to three and I bought one of them every year, the entire dynamic changes. It's like mass production of toys. You used to pay a little wooden carver to make your kid a toy and now toys are being pumped out of every plastic factory. Mass production and, and, and lack of scarcity changes everything. How much did we pay for Delicious Library, right? That was expensive. I know. Oh, yeah. 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 But it was it's worth it. Thousands of dollars for Final Cut, right? Like thousands of dollars every couple of years yep. for, for Adobe Suites and for Final Cut. And I would only buy one or two apps a year, literally only buy one or two apps a year. And yep. now you're like, oh, dollar, 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 dollar. And, and so, on the plus side, now I'm, I'm paying for more software than ever. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Lori. I think the problem with this idea of it, there were so few of them, so we paid more for them, and now there's too many of them, so we pay less for them. That's that's detrimental to the the quality uh, program makers, the quality app makers. They have to reduce their price in order to compete with, the, you know, the the five thousand others that do do the same thing for free. Because the if I if I'm a consumer and I go in the app store and I see this one that's twenty dollars. And to me, it looks the same as the thousand others that are 99 cents or free. I'm going to spend, I will, I personally wouldn't, but a, a consumer might actually spend a thousand dollars trying to find the perfect 99 cent app instead of just spending $20 on that expensive one because they don't want to spend that money up front. So those, those good quality 
developers have lost out on on this like mass um, production of apps that are cheaper. I, Let me I, ask you I all this. I personally think it's a bad idea. Are, do we notice a, a dearth of great apps on iOS? I, mean, I do. It, I wouldn't Absolutely. say so. There's it's, some it's harder. Like you, you hear the developers talk about it. Like there was a whole. I understand they're the bitching, but they're not stopping. Well, I mean, how do we like? There, there, there are developers, and there's like really well-known ones who have stopped making apps. Like they just don't make the apps they used to. They only make one app. They're they're hard to experiment. They just know they or they go to work for a company doing contract work because you know Google can make as many camera apps as they want, but it's, but it's right. much harder for Sebastian Dewitt to make or or Ben Rice to make uh, Obscura or Halide. I guess we'll never know if there's a great app that's not getting developed, but it feels like there's still very high quality. A great range of very high quality apps on iOS. People are not turning and, their back mm -hmm. on the App Store. I don't think. No, they're just trying to figure out how to like like Overcast has tried three or four different business models by this right. point, trying right. to find one that's sustainable. Mm -hmm. I'll just I'll just all I all I want to say is that um, I think that there's uh, a lot of crap on every single App Store, and it way 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 outweighs all the good stuff. I will say though that uh, on the Mac and particularly on iOS, the quality of interesting wow I've never seen an app approach this problem this way or do this this effectively and this cleanly or take advantage of a mobile platform as opposed to transmogrifying a desktop app so cleanly and beautifully and elegant as I can see on iOS. Um, I've st I really like the Chromebook that I picked up a few months ago, but I really do miss having an app, uh, <laughs> having like my writing app or my uh, my markup app or my drawing dra drawing app that uh, for which there are kind of analogs on other platforms platforms you can get things if you have a microsoft surface if you have a chromebook you can kind of get these apps but you can't get something like scrivener something that savory an app particularly a productivity app like that so they, i think they they will always have the best of the best the question is are there enough apps that are of that quality to distract people away from hey at best buy i can get this chromebook for 250 bucks or hey look my, my office is, is buying me microsoft surface devices uh, i'm just going to use that as my personal computer uh, but th th i think apple needs to leverage how good the quality of their best apps are because they're yeah. just unsurpassed well, I agree. I mean, I you know, we do an app cap every week on iOS today and uh there're plenty of great apps to highlight, you know. I I don't I don't lack any great apps out there. And and as you say, Andy, some of them are really different and interesting and uh unique. Sure there's yeah, 100 but, uh, fart apps, but there's also some pretty good. <laughs> are there still? Yeah. I feel like uh, I haven't heard about them in a while. Uh, I think everybody who wanted a fart app has a fart app. I think that's probably Are you are you are you, are you accepting pitches? Are you saying that you're looking for someone to write a roundup of fart apps cuz I got nothing to do with them. <laughs> <laughs> no, in fact, if, if you think about it, I think really most of the innovative software design today is happening on iOS. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Uh, let us, uh, should we take a break? Yeah, let's take another break. I, I just, I'm really conscious of the time. I don't want to, yep. <laughs> I don't want to run into a, a deadline or anything for Renee and Lori who have work to do today. But I do want to talk about the screw. But... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> what what a teaser yes. for, for the next segment. Coming up, it's uh, screwing time. But first, <laughs> let's talk about meat. Okay, Lori, are you a vegetarian? <laughs> I'm not. Okay, yes. That Good. is one of the best transitions I've <laughs> ever seen you do, Leo. And I have seen you do really great transitions. <laughs> when, you, when you have a sponsor as great as Butcher Box, it just makes you want to talk about meat. This is, uh, like, this box is so big. Ah, there it is. Fortunately, I don't think there's any meat in here. I think maybe we, <laughs> this is where our, our meat came in our butcher box. I love butcher box, by the way. It's better meat for a better you. This isn't just everyday meat. This isn't something you go down to your corner store and get. But it is kind of like your neighborhood butcher. Quality beef, chicken, pork delivered right to your door. They were doing salmon, I think, too. Boy, we got some good... Alaskan wild salmon that was amazing. Choose so from hungry now. I know. Get ready because you're <laughs> going to get more hungry. And by the way, this just isn't, isn't just everyday beef. This is grass-fed, grass-finished beef. If you've never had grass-fed beef, the flavor is completely different from what you're getting at your local store. Grass-fed, grass-finished beef is delicious. Free-range organic chicken, heritage bred, uh, breed pork. They they literally have better meat. Uh, partly because they believe in a healthier food system. They want everyone to access meat the way nature intended, free of antibiotics, free of hormones, humanely raised, 
you know you are delicious. You're eating delicious, healthy, high-quality meat. Now, it's going to come to you in a big old butcher box like this one. Meat's frozen at the peak of freshness in individual vacuum-packed biodegradable packaging. By the way, I love it because I can just throw it right in the sous vide machine, which we did the last, we had some uh, T-bone steaks last week. Actually, it was ribeyes, and they were fabulous. And I just, I, I sous vide them, uh, and then I threw them on the grill. Man, they were good. Each box is shipped with a carefully calculated amount of dry ice, which ensures it remains frozen even if after it reaches your doorstep. Uh, it's delivered to you for free. And what's nice is you can customize your delivery easily. Build your own box. Choose exactly how much and what your family will love. Your delivery frequency. You also get recipe cards with tips to cook quality meals. This wild Alaskan salmon. Oh, good. They do have it. Yes. They've announced this. Uh, and this is brand new. If you haven't uh, tried Butcher Box lately, this wild Alaskan salmon is the best salmon I've ever had in my life. It is pure, sustainably harvested salmon from Bristol Bay, Alaska. This is not what you're going to find in your local store. It is red, not because they put dye in it, <laughs> as they do with some farm farmed uh, salmon. This is this is naturally red, fresh, delicious, and as nutrient rich as you can get. It is so good. All right, I know I've made you hungry. Look at that. You get two pounds of this, two pounds of this free. Right now, and twenty dollars off your first box when you go to butcherbox.com slash macbreak and enter macbreak at checkout. We sous vide the salmon, grilled it. It's the best thing I ever had in my life. It's amazing. Twenty dollars off your first box. But you don't have to sous vide it, by the way. I don't want everybody to think, oh, you gotta no, you don't. Uh, in fact, we uh, we uh, Taco Tuesday is Taco Tuesday at the Laporte household. And uh, we the hamburger is amazing because again, uh, like all the beef. It's uh, it's uh, um, grass fed and grass finished, so it has such a s delicious flavor. And I made that uh, we made the tacos that were incredible. Taco Tuesday, no <laughs> sous vide involved. Butcherbox.com slash MacBreak. Do use the code MacBreak at checkout for twenty dollars off and two pounds of free wild Alaskan salmon. Yay! Ugh. <laughs> hungry now? Butcherbox.com so slash MacBreak. <laughs> This is the best sponsor ever. We got, when, when the butcher box came, uh, they sent us three boxes so we could give Jason Howell and Megan Maroney some for their uh, ad reads. And so there, my son texted me because he's right out, his office is right outside the door saying, there's three giant boxes of meat for you in the lobby. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy, my butcher box is here. Yay. So the, for one of a screw, Apple's, <laughs> Mac Pro was almost lost. Remember how what a big deal it was uh, that they were assembling the uh, black trash can Mac in uh, Texas, in the United States. New York Times technology uh, story: A tiny screw shows why iPhones won't be assembled in the U.S. of A. When Apple began making the three thousand dollar Mac Pro in Austin, it struggled, according to three people who worked on the project and spoke on the condition of anonymity because of confidentiality agreements, it struggled to find the screws. Yeah. In Apple, in China rather, Apple relied on factories that could produce all the custom screws on a, on a minute's notice. What do you want? We'll make it. You got it tomorrow. Yeah. In Texas, turns out screw suppliers a little harder to come by. They couldn't even test new versions of the computer because the 20-person uh, machine shop that Apple's contractor was relying on could produce only a thousand screws a day at most the Times says the screw shortage was one of several problems that postponed sales of the computer for months remember they announced it in december yeah. or uh, no in september or october and we didn't get it till january well now we know it was because of the screwed. screws and in fact apple we got screwed apple had to go to china <laughs> they actually ordered the screws from china yeah. In order to mass produce the computer in Home Depot? Texas. I mean, did they check? Like, did, <laughs> well, it's, yeah. I mean, it's, that's, They're it's, custom. It's old, that's the problem. They're not. Yeah. Uh, we, yeah. It's, it's an old story, but bears repeating time and time again. This, this is why Steve Jobs <laughs> told, told Obama manufacturing jobs are not coming back. It's not, be, it's not because of cheap labor. It's not because of favorable tax situations. It's because uh, there is a, there is a uh, business <laughs> order inside Shenzhen and other manufacturing cities where you can have a company that does nothing but manufacture screws. 
uh, which means they have the capacity to build any screw you want on pretty much any demand at any quantity at any time frame uh, because that's all they do. Instead of having to contract a machining company that is filled with incredibly talented people in the latest technology, but they're a machining company that will build pretty much anything. So when you say we, we need to build screws right now, they may not have ever had to manufacture this particular part in this particular quantity. Uh, and also you're talking about a company that every time you have a uh, every problem that can be encountered in manufacturing a screw, they've encountered it and they've solved it. Uh, every time uh, and every time uh, if Samsung, for instance, came to them with a, 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 a they need a weird uh, thread count or they need a weird profile to fit this weird sort of part that they've got that can, can't be any bigger or any wider than this, they have they will figure that out and then the next when Apple comes and asks them for something similar because they're also trying to get rid of this bezel or they're trying to put this component someplace, they don't have to start from square one. They are, they've already had experience making this screw. That's the that's the problem. It's not even, again, it's not uh, uh, the, the fact that labor costs so much less is not as is not the biggest problem, I think. The fact that there is apparently a culture of we're just we're just but we're workers we are just supposed to do what we're told is also not as big a deal as the fact that you just can't get what you need at the time frame you need it uh, if that's going to cause an, a company like Apple to ever want to uh, build something in uh, the United States of America uh, so drastically because of the economic situations or because of embargoes, that might mean that they're going to have to say, well, guess what? <laughs> guess what? You cannot have that custom screw. You have to order something from this catalog that we know that we've got a factory in in, in the Dakotas that is just building these screws. They've been doing it for 30 years. <laughs> they built each one out of a one block of Aspen log, and they know how to do this sort of stuff. It's really, really a difficult problem. There's no solution to it. So I have to say a little bit that this article might, look a little like a justifying piece from Apple because, uh, you know, you're right. Part of it is saying, well, it's not to save money that we manufacture in China. In fact, Cook said in uh, late 2017, well, that, that too. <laughs> in the U.S., yeah, but it is that too. In the U.S., you could have a meeting of tooling engineers. I'm not sure we could fill the room in China. You could fill multiple football fields. Um, they also, in this article, pointed out, look, we spend... $60 billion last year with 9,000 American suppliers, 450,000 jobs. Uh, you know, Apple, this is a little bit, and I would suspect Apple had a little something to do with the writing of this article, a little bit of a message to the White House uh, that, oh, no, really, we're not only are we helping American jobs, but we have to manufacture in China. Um, and, I mean, you could probably say, look, if Apple decided to use more standard parts, or Apple spent some energy, you know, doing what they did in China already, which is to build up manufacture in the United States. I mean, a lot of this is because Apple intentionally created a manufacturing giant in Shenzhen. Yeah. But it's also, it's a sum of so many things. Like a lot of decisions we decided to make, uh, I'm saying like North America, America and Canada, what we chose to value, how we chose to do education. My grandfather moved here at the age of 60 and he got a job instantly because he was a machinist and we were desperate for them. Canada had abandoned all its trade schools, had very, very few qualified machinists, and they would hire anybody that they could either fly in, boat in, or any while I'll get into the country. And we we just don't have great education systems. We don't have great trade school systems. And we have not dedicated vast swaths of the Yukon or Texas to build these giant hub factories that can satisfy. And, but again, part of that is because we have moved it offshore. Uh, the Times yeah. quotes a manufacturer of screws in Lockhart, Texas, uh, the Caldwell Manufacturing Company, they made 28,000 screws for Apple. But the the, the, the owner and president, uh, Stephen Mello, said when he bought Caldwell in 2002, it was capable of the high volume production Apple needed, but demand had dried up as manufacturing moved to China. So, you know, this is something Apple's brought on in some yeah. respects, right? He said that well, yeah. he had replaced the old stamping presses that could mass produce screws with machines designed for more precise specialized jobs because people are going to go to China to get the cheap stuff. And so we're going to have to make something that is not quite so cheap. Yeah. 
We realize that every time a manufacturing plant shuts down in the United States, the tooling is and the machinery is usually shipped to China. They're usually built by they're usually bought by a Chinese factory. Uh, and when the when the history of the world <laughs> for for the past century is written, it will be acknowledged that one of the most transformative, both from a financial, uh, labor and a cultural perspective, is the invention of the container ship that makes it really really easy to build something or manufacture a part halfway across the world and have it shipped across. Uh, and Rene is absolutely right. It's, I think one part of the problem is that uh, uh, the United States and other countries, countries just realize too late how important it is to invest in labor, to invest in labor, to make sure as part of your critical infrastructure, you are supporting labor, people working and making things. Uh, because uh, China did absolutely that. They made, they uh, again, based on whatever advantages they had uh, as uh, because their their government setup, they have the ability to simply say, we we have lots and lots Lots of people. We have lots of lots of hands to build lots and lots of things. We can, and we, now we have the ability to be a, have a marketplace of the entire world. We're going to take advantage of this. The Times also points out that another problem with manufacturing in the U.S. American workers don't work around the clock. Yeah, China is not. They quote an economics professor from Case Western. China is not just cheap. It's a place where, because it's an authoritarian government, you can marshal a hundred thousand people to work all night for you. And that's an essential part of the product rollout strategy. You know, Apple doesn't want to make this stuff, start making this stuff in April. So, uh, you know, the fact that we can crank out more in a shorter period of time is important. We have night shifts here. Gruber took exception to that because his father worked <laughs> the night shift for like for decades. <laughs> yeah. and they, we have night shifts and weekend workers here. That, I that, guess. That part's weird. Okay. Yeah. But, but, we don't, well, but, but what we that, don't I'm have sorry, in the United States anymore is is the infrastructure of manufacturing. There, it, It's part of our history, but we... It, it all companies, not not just tech companies, but companies started getting things manufactured overseas. That that's what happened. So to kind of like, we should just bring back factory workers and bring back factories. It it's so much bigger than that. Just one company can't just suddenly you know buy a building and suddenly have screws manufactured for them for the rest of their lives. We yep. we as a country decided that we didn't want to be a manufacturing company, and now. We're, we're wondering why we can't, you know, j fill jobs for, for people in the United States because we pushed all of those jobs overseas and can't bring it back. The, like the, the, need, the ability to do it is, is large. All companies would need to come back to the U.S. if we were going to like reestablish like a strong manufacturing culture in the United States. It can't just be one company or one year. It has to kind of everybody has to do it to bring it back to the U.S. Actually, there was a spike in overnight uh, night shift workers uh, over the last couple of decades in the United States. And uh, the last I, number I saw is 3.2% of the entire workforce works overnight. So we do have overnight workers. But, well, but uh, I don't know if we have we slave also, labor that <laughs> work for well, $2 an hour. Sl 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 <laughs> slave labor is a, is, a, is a hard word because there is such a thing as slave labor sl slave labor uh, in the world. The difference is that we do have a fundamental protections for labor. Labor has a certain amount of power that lots of politicians have been trying to chip away at and gover governors uh, from the states have been trying to chip away at uh, year after year after year. But there is a fundamental system in place that says that there is a certain level of abuse that you cannot inflict upon a labor force, even if you, d even if that labor force is willing to be abused, uh, but because they, they need that job so badly. Uh, so I, and the last thing I want is for uh, us to go back to what the situation was like in the late 1800s, uh, uh, early 20, early 1900s, where really everything, anything goes. We had an unrelated, unregulated labor, uh, labor industry, and excuse me, we had un, unregulated uh, relationships between corporate uh, corporate entities and their labor and labor and labor. Excuse me, and uh, these. I'm so sorry. I've been very very stumbly. Uh, what I'm saying is that we had a system of no laws for a while. We saw how badly companies were treating workers without any regulations uh, overseeing them, and we saw what happened. We decided as a country we did not want that to happen. Uh, and this is, and the result is that now we have a, a system where people have a right to be paid. They have a right to be safe. I'm not necessarily sure that the same is true all over the world, and that's our disadvantage as long as we have cargo mm -hmm. ships uh, going all the way across the world. And that's where, you know, we that the it doesn't cost as much money to make people in in that are in unregulated countries work long hours with no 
um, safety measures in place to make sure that they're healthy. So that's that's the payoff. You know, we we in the United States decided that we didn't want to treat our our uh, us ourselves so poorly. So we put regulations in place to protect ourselves, and then the end result is that the companies just went somewhere else and did it to someone else. So it would be so great to bring back this kind of labor in the United States as long as we could obviously keep the same um, protections in place for for workers so that, you know, you only work a 40-hour week or you get paid overtime for the extra work that you do, that you have a a certain amount of hours per day that you get to rest and leave, you know, to go be with your family, things like that. Those are all, you know, part of those, those regulations put in place to protect workers. So if we could have that, pay them the, the, a wage that, that was sustainable to their families and have manufacturing in the United States. Yeah, that would be great. Everybody wants that, including these giant corporations that have moved overseas. They want that too. They would love that. It would be great. But it's not happening right now under, you know, by asking one company to come back yeah. or something like that, you know. As Studs Terkel said time and, said time, and time again, uh, if you got to go home at 5 p.m., if you did not have to work on Sunday, thank the people who got shot in the middle of Chicago, uh, labor labor organizers and protesters who bought you that right uh, several decades ago. So iOS 12.2 is out in beta, and of course, immediately, Stephen Trout and Smith started pouring through the code and found references to four new iPad models, including Wi-Fi and cellular models, uh, this kind of coincides with registration info for seven new iPad models that was uh, delivered to the Eurasian Economic Commission database. I guess that's like FCC approval in the U.S. You got to do this in uh, Europe and Asia. So I'm gonna I'm gonna go to Renee Ritchie, who is our <laughs> source code parser. Uh, Troughton speculated there might be new iPad Minis. Yeah, and an iPod Touch device without fingerprint or Face ID. Um, does that all make sense to you? Uh, so the iPad mini has been rumored for a while. You know, Apple's as much as the iPad pro has gone up in price, Apple's been good at pushing the iPad, the iPad, nothing, the iPad 9.7 down and adding new features to it, like Apple pencil support and bringing back the iPad mini, uh, with a non laminated screen would slot really nicely underneath that iPad and make an even more affordable option, especially for education and for enterprise that wanted to use it in a mass deployment uh, and Apple pencil support on the mini would be great as well. It would be like that. My, the digital field notes of my dreams. So I'm all, you know, I'm all happy yeah. for that. The, the non, Sorry. the non touch ID, <laughs> non face ID thing, you know, Steve mentioned that it doesn't make much sense. Um, there, it, it could be a very, very specific device at a very, very specific, um, price point, but it, it's hard to see just not including touch ID on anything anymore, given how many, how many years old it is and how relatively inexpensive that technology is now. Yeah, I, I, I'm sorry. I had an emotional response to the idea of, I know, right? of a digital field note. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I still have my three or four-year-old iPad mini. I still use it so often because there are times where you just want something that's sort of like almost pocket-sized. Uh, and if I, if Apple were to create something like if, – if, if something with the attitude of what if people who don't necessarily want a $900 iPhone also want a really good iOS device uh, and they and they were able to, uh, let's say, take the $329 9.7-inch iPad and decide we're going to make a 7-inch iPad that costs even less than that, that has all basically all the features of that one – that could be incredible, uh, particularly if if the reduction in screen size meant a re- uh, and, and reduction in uh, physical size meant a reduction in actual cost to make it. Uh, you could also imagine that little hands might be, be- better with a little screen, uh, and it might be an even better solution for uh, for education. Anything else? But yeah, I would be so I, that would, that would put me back in line the night before the store opens for the first <laughs> time for an Apple product. If Apple decided to create a small a, a smaller iPad Mini with a modern CPU. So when would they announce these new iPads? I mean, if they're putting these in the database, the Eurasian electronics database For the last two years, like the the iPad 5 came out March two years ago. iPad 6 came out March last year. Uh, Or it's actually April last year, then April two years ago, then March this year. If Apple does a March event, which they've done, I think, seven out of the last 10 years, then that would be a prime time for it. But it just seems like they've they've sort of segregated those iPads out into the spring and left the pros or the pros around a lot. But 
Yeah, education timing, exactly. Was that the last event? Was it an edu it was that was the one in the school? That was in in Chicago, Chicago, yeah. Chicago. So an education event in the spring, most likely. I think that might have been my first Mac Break Weekly. Oh, Wasn't wow. that April April? <gasps> Those were the oh, days. So fast. <laughs> you first met Lori Gill. <laughs> Um, yeah, I would love to see a mini. I agree with you, Andy. That's one I'd get in line for. I, I gave my mini away because I had the iPad Pro. And as much as I love the 12.9-inch iPad Pro, which to me is the most amazing device ever, I, I'd almost wish they'd do a mini Pro. That That's keyboard, though, Leo. That keyboard. The uh, smart keyboard that small, that size. Does your keyboard <laughs> start up in a caps lock every time? It's driving no, me nuts. Never. Every time I type, it's caps. I go, uh -huh. So, First uh, cap or all caps? Try restarting. All, uh, cap lock. So wow. Wow. I I did order, and I hope to get by that time frame, the uh, the new um, uh, keyboard. What was the is it the bridge? The bridge. That's it. B r y g e. Yeah. So the Jason Snell of keyboards. The Jason Snell. <laughs> it turns the iPad Pro into a laptop. Yeah. It does. In weight, size, <laughs> thickness. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Not quite in functionality. Needs a trackpad. Um, so Needs a track the, the idea, <laughs> the idea of the iPad Mini. Uh, now that we're just kind of discussing it, I'm just thinking. You, there's the iPhone SE went away, and there's been a little bit of kind of um, research. Came back for like for five minutes the, last week. <laughs> right, and, and it, it's it, it's making me think that Apple maybe is kind of positioning. Okay, so you want a big phone? We can't make a an inexpensive big phone. So what we're going to do is sunset the less expensive big phone and we're going to make small tablets so that you can still be a part of the Apple ecosystem without having to spend a thousand dollars on your phone. It makes a lot of a sense that if Apple's going to get rid of the iPhone SE, that now is the time for them to bring back a very low cost uh, iPad mini for those people who don't want to spend or can't afford to spend that large amount of money to enter the Apple ecosystem, you know, phones have been traditionally the way um, new people would come to the Apple ecosystem. And maybe this iPad mini is Apple's way of saying, we still want to bring you new people into the system, but we can't make a good phone for the price that you want it, but we can make a tablet. Yeah, Lori makes a really great point. If Apple really does want to double down on services, they, one of the best ways to do it would be to make sure that there are of greater variety and less expensive, really good devices that people can use to access that video service and that game service and that cloud service. Uh, and maybe an iPad, an iPad mini would really, really suit that bill. It's a really good idea. We, can only we figured hope. it all out. We can, but yeah, hope. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what about uh, where, where's the power mat or whatever the hell they call that coming out? Air power. Air power. The power mat. I'll believe it that when I'm sitting good. on the toasty surface, Leo. <laughs> yes. <Exactly. laughs> uh, the Verge says Apple's next AirPods. We also keep hearing rumors about that. We'll support hands-free Hey Siri. That's in twelve two. Yeah. I mean, I don't think the Verge said that. I think German said that a year ago. Oh, German said that. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Verge just repeating it now that 12.2 is yep. out. Uh, these are all things, again, we can but hope. Apple has decided, yes, we're going to pay the iPhone photo contest winners. It wasn't Good clear from the initial announcement. They've added that to no, the mean, announcement. Well, the, it was, it was, the announcement it was, was, it was, was... I'm sorry. Go ahead. Sorry. Okay. The, they were always so like this is not the first time they've done these things. They always pay a licensing fee, of course they, even do. if they find your photo on the internet. Um, so, uh, shot on iPhone was not an Apple thing. They noticed people doing that on the internet, and they thought it was the best community thing ever, and they got fully behind it. But whenever they've approached anybody, they've always paid a licensing fee. They sort of wanted to aim it at photographers, and then the initial pushback was like, "I'm a pro. I'm going to get paid for my work. How dare you?" And it's sort of like, "Well, it wasn't meant for pros, but now you're getting all aggro about it." So Apple was forced to make a statement on it, and now you see a lot of pros wanting to enter. Although that's the equivalent of spec work to me, so I don't understand what their problem was with right. it to begin with. But and Apple, and the point is that Apple were, always paid. It's not that Apple didn't pay; they just yes. didn't mention it. If this yes. was an LG contest, no, they would not have gotten an ink of 
Right. Well, the, the, oh, well, that's it's just that it's a it's an ongoing sore spot not only for pros but also for amateurs that people that uh, you, that so many companies will have a, a quote contest unquote where they hey create new content for us we will choose the ones we like and not pay you for it and say aren't you wonderful for having won this contest uh, I did think it was very very good of them to make sure it was really really clear in the contest rules that we are not buying all rights to your photo we are buying rights exclusive we are buying non exclusive worldwide rights to it for one year. Uh, for the for use in these situations, uh, so it wasn't like, hey, congrats, thank you, thank you for hashtagging your photo. Now it's ours. Now we've got this great, <laughs> we've got this great database of photos that we can draw from every time we need to test something or use something. Uh, but yeah, it was. I thought it was important for them to mention that. Oh, by the way, there will be a licensing fee involved because that comes down to basic respect for creators. Uh, and I, I don't. I think it was just an innocent uh, leave off. I don't think it was that they no. were pressured into adding it. But it was no, important. I have a slightly for them to different take because I worked as a designer for years and we used to call contest spec work. It's like, we're doing a logo. We'll pay the winner a thousand bucks. You just want a thousand people to submit a logo to you that we don't get paid for making. Right. So, yeah. I mean, like, so like none of this stuff, like it's a contest, allow it to be a contest. You don't, like, this, this was a very bad example of internet group rage to me. I'm glad Apple did specify it. I don't think if you, if you want to be offended by it, you can be just as offended by a paid contest because you're still getting a bunch of submissions that you're not paying for at the end of the day. So there is really no way to limit the rage on this stuff, but uh, I hope it is a fantastic fantastic contest for everybody who as mature adults decides to enter it. That, that, that is a good point because in the press release, it wasn't like, hey, hashtag us with your best photos and we'll award a prize to somebody. Uh, it, it really was, oh, by the way, this is a juried sort of competition. Yeah. Here, are the, here are the people who are on the jury and most of them are really, really interesting people to jury, jury a contest. But again, I, th I think it was a important thing for them to say that, oh, and of course we'll pay you for this. Uh, yeah, I think that that's a, that's an important point to make is that in in when you're kind of an independent artist, speaking as an independent artist, um, it's good to know that there are people that are on your side out there. I've I've come across a couple of different situations where somebody didn't want to pay for the art because it was it was uh, the the person with the or that wanted the art or that was displaying the art they're they're bigger than the independent person who was making the art so they their idea was well you're you're getting exposure through this so that you, you yeah. know, that's isn't that bigger yeah, than I've money offers too <clears throat> and it's that's, important that's to, to <laughs> I, he I said read sadly a exposures a month that's great <laughs> i got asked to design an entire video game for exposure i mean the entire the whole thing is just makes me so angry i tried to pay the rent by exposing myself to the landlord that didn't work <laughs> <laughs> That's the wrong kind of exposure, you should, I guess. You yes. should have shaved your legs first. You know, I never had a problem with that. <laughs> uh, speaking of internet work. outrage, the register says Apple is patenting parts of Swift, but it's for your own good. And Apple's, in fact, said, uh, it's, and, and people have speculated that these patents on parts of the Swift language are done under the Apache 2 license, and the intent really is defense not offense. Yeah. Apache 2 yeah. uh, grants users the right to use patent-encumbered code from any contributor, including Apple, but the rights terminate upon attempting to bring a patent infringement claim against any entity over a Swift project. So, if you might have read that Swift is being patented, and, and you hope that that's not true because it's an open-source project and it shouldn't be patented, that's probably not the reason. It's good news. They're doing yeah. it to protect you. Yes, I, I believe that there's a, there's an entire industry around looking for uh, looking for IP that is poorly protected, claiming ownership mm -hmm. of it. Not even like buying buying a related patent and claiming infringement, but claiming ownership of it and then forcing this company to fight it out. Uh, so uh, Apple could fight those battles, uh, and they are fighting those battles by essentially owning the patents on this code. Uh, but an independent developer certainly couldn't. So I certainly believe Apple uh, about when they talk, when they say it's in it's in defense. Yeah, and I think using the Apache 2 license kind of yeah makes it. And makes also, it also Apple is trustworthy in this regard. Yeah. So, well, honestly, they want people to use Swift. Encumbering yes. it is not going to make more people use it. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but this on the other a, hand, if you defend it, that might make more people use it. Yeah, yeah, they the, want you to. They want to protect you while you're using it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, let's see. Um, I don't care about Apple patents, although there's one on the iPhones and watches that would allow them to act as poisonous gas detectors. Okay. 
you know, <laughs> it's a dystopian future, Leo. We're just going to live in it <laughs> until until 2020. <laughs> until until a positive result for some people in 2020, let's just be ready <laughs> just in case worst case scenarios happen. And the drumbeat for Apple's streaming video service, which will almost certainly launch this year, has ramped up a little bit. At Sundance yesterday, they bought their first movie, a coming of age Ooh. film, Hala, from Jada Pinkett Smith. So they have the global rights. Uh, they bought them yesterday, which... I mean, you don't buy the rights to a movie unless you got a way to distribute it. Uh, and I'm, yep. I guess it could just be iTunes. But there's also uh, some speculation on the information that they might make a hardware device, an inexpensive Apple TV device, uh, kind of like <laughs> a rubber touch. stick. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, the iPod Touch. There you go. <laughs> um, so I think that uh, what well, we're, I would say maybe that's another thing we'd expect in a spring announcement. Yeah. Yeah. That'd the last one was just put out. They didn't even have it in an event. They just. Put it on the storage. This, shelves. this. If you're going to announce though a streaming service, you're going to have a big event. It's going. Yeah, it wouldn't be, be an like education they, event either. That's true. Yeah. No, ex exactly. It would, it would be. It It'd would be a be Hollywood, Hollywood event. event. Exactly. It would be like Tidal, mm -hmm. where they're going to get a stage with nine or ten people that are going to get ten billion <laughs> views just on the or just by virtue of the fact that this incredible celebrity is on stage in public somewhere. So, I mean, this is it's <laughs> I, this is going to be two years in the making at least. They've 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 got uh, if the Oscars uh, had trouble getting a host <laughs> in three months' time, mm -hmm. imagine uh, how much um, how much work Apple is doing to get make an event that's way more important than the Oscars telecast. Yeah. yeah. Uh, any other stories that I've missed that we want to get in? Because we want to get you out of here in a few minutes as we get ready for Apple's fourth quarter uh, results, their analyst call and their uh, press release in about five minutes. The only one that really interested me this week as well was the Aetna app that Apple cooperated with them on making, which is interesting just on its own. It's, a, it's an Apple Watch app that tries to incentivize you to do things for your health. It sends you notifications about flu shots and other vaccines, about reminds you to make your doctor's I like appointments. That. Also, so, but there is concern because we've seen a lot of insurance companies use connected devices to right. deny, defer, yeah. or otherwise, um, you know, OBD meddle with your cars, coverage. Yeah. So Apple's done this thing with Aetna where you ha you download the app. That's fine. You can opt in. Like you get all the benefits. There's no restrictions on it. You can opt in to share your data, which will help make the machine learning better. Like, oh, it's better. Like the, most people respond to the notification in the day instead of night. So we'll send more notifications in the day. But in spring, it's different. So all that. So it's double opt-in if you want to share your data. And also, uh, everything is encrypted in transit on the servers. And Aetna is not allowed to use any of it for actuarial purposes, which some people still don't trust. And I think that's perfectly valid not to trust it. I think we'll have to wait and see how it goes. But I think at a certain point, um, these companies are going to realize that keeping their insurers healthier is going to lower their bottom line, not just dicking them out of the coverage that they deserve. <laughs> So yeah. this is, uh, it's called Attain. You have to sign attain, up to yeah. get it right now. It's space is limited. Sign up now. And I presume you have to be an Aetna uh, yes. uh, customer. There's no point in doing this if Aetna's not your health insurance company. And they reward you for following up on the goals by giving you discounts on the Apple Watch. Or if you don't want that, giving you gift cards for retailers. And they said that's like 90% effective in helping promote wow. um, activity. I'd uh, love to see my uh, health insurer yep. do this. I'm a, I'm a Kaiser uh, user. And that would be really, uh, that's the kind of thing Kaiser would do too. I, yeah. they I, did, I would they love did to see this. Apple had a similar deal, I think, with uh, with uh, John Hancock Insurance. Yeah, uh, I don't know. I don't know whether it was this uh, this intimate between the the insurer and Apple, but they had something similar where use Apple Apple Watch tracking will give you deals on Apple hardware and other fitness products. I'm considering signing up at great expense, I might add, for a um, a, a diet plan called Verta Health. I would love, actually, if anybody listening. Has any experience with it? I'd love to hear. Before I sign up, I'd love to hear <laughs> about it. But it has an app. You, you, uh, you, it's the idea is diabetes type two diabetes reversal through a ketogenic diet, and uh, they you you do a blood prick, you test your uh, blood sugars and ketones, and put that in the app every day. You, you do uh, uh, phone calls, telemedicine phone calls with physicians and support people. Uh, they have a form. It's a, an interesting digital hybrid. They just raised a ton of money. Uh, because it's a startup, uh, but it's also very expensive uh, if you do it for a year, which I think is how you do it. But they have supposedly very good results. So if anybody's done it, I'd love to love to get some feedback before I plonk down my money. Um, Soylent. Just go with Soy Soylent. I did it's Soylent for a while. You know, I've done everything. And I finally <laughs> oh, no, realized I this is... I, I did get, by the way, input from my actual physician. 
yeah. who said, well, it's kind of expensive, but uh, and I'm not really a big fan of ketogenic diets. I would rather see something more plant based. But uh, hey, if you know, if it works, you know, I always say it's cheaper than a heart attack. <laughs> so we shall see. Apparently, no, Kaiser no. has, according Leo? to Berkeley Stephen in our chat room, started a small project in Oakland, which includes a series of apps for the watch. So maybe they are testing something else out. That's interesting. I don't. I don't want to nitpick, but if the heart attack kills you, you're not buying any more Soylent. <laughs> <laughs> My point exactly. It's cheaper so, than a heart attack, right? So, so, if, so if death, but if death, so if death is not part of your plans, then the math works out. I see. Well, I was hoping I survive the heart attack, but you're right. Okay. There's nothing if, cheaper than dying. I, I would. I, I, would, I don't want you to have a heart attack. But <laughs> once, if you were once to you're have dead, one, the costs matters. go way down. Your your nails guess, and hair I'm, continue I'm, to grow, but the but the actual life costs go way down. I'm I'm just being like an IM, uh, IMDb commenter. <laughs> where, excuse me, uh, the, 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 the live version of heart attacks can be quite in expensive. But you they did. were wearing microphones made in 2013. <laughs> I should also point out uh, that the uh, I don't know anybody cares, but Office 365 is now available in the Mac App Store. Uh, yeah. As far as I could tell, the same Office 365 that's just in the App Store. And you, of course, still have to have a subscription for at least $8 a month uh, to Office. Uh, yeah. so. Although Microsoft and Apple work together really hard to make the update process much more Mac-like and much less I do actually like, like that because I don't like the Microsoft updater launching and taking yeah. over. So the fact that it would update through the App Store, actually, you know what? That's a selling point. That is a selling yeah. point. Yeah. Also, it's a it's a big pain in the butt to make something work with the app store. People don't understand exactly even just the idea of looking at being able to have a an app that saves a file, but that that means it has to have access to the file system, which means it has to access a certain sandbox model. Uh, I mean, uh, was it last year that Apple did their big hey and here are logos of all the apps that are coming back to the app store? Um, I sh I'm reminding myself that I should probably do a follow up and find out yeah, how many of those apps Rich, are actually there. Yeah, because Rich Siegel's uh, you know uh, editor. Uh, Barebone Software's editor was one of those. That he Rich talked about it, but is it in the App Store now? Uh, I don't think it's in the App I Store. BB yet. Edit is not in the App Store, um, as far as I if remember. If you like, I'll, I'll, I'll ask if he wants to talk about it. If it's still, yeah. in, it, I'm, I'm sure he's still working on it. So I doubt that he'd want to talk about it until it's done. Okay, but that'd yeah, just, be an interesting topic. Just get a deep background. You don't have to say who from. <laughs> Uh, and now that we've discussed it, no one will be able. to. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I should point out. And Apple did, certainly. Users will be able to purchase a subscription for Office 365 from within the apps. <laughs> that way. Yeah, I want to know what that deal is like, don't mm -hmm. you? Is it 15% yeah. up front? Is it 10%, 5%, nothing? Does Apple do that? Do they have different deals with different companies? They for had for Netflix for a while before they mm -hmm. made a more general policy. So it I mean, mm -hmm. if, if you are as big as Apple, there's a lot of negotiating. You can, as I mean, big as Microsoft. Big, but if you're yeah. huge, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's, there's, there's a lot of negotiation you can do. All right, let's take a little time out. And uh, when we come back, gentlemen and lady, please prepare your pick of the week. I'm going to show you my pick right now, which is this thing. I've been wearing this aura ring. I know you've seen it for months. Kevin Rose turned me on to this. He was on triangulation. He was wearing it. I said, what's that? He said, oh, it's an aura ring. It's the, the, the new hotness. Uh, he said, I'll introduce you to the founder. He did. I talked to Harpreet. I said, I'll buy one. Actually, I think he sent me one, but we've bought some since because it's so good. Lisa has one. The aura ring is the best, most accurate sleep and activity tracker ever. Not the least of which reason is it's on your finger. It's a ring. It has measurements that other devices don't have. It's got an infrared optical pulse measurement. And by the way, your finger is a better place to do that than your wrist or anywhere else. Uh, with a 3D accelerometer, gyroscope, and a body temperature sensor. I love my Aura ring. Let me show you the insights you get. I'll just launch the, uh, the Aura app here and show you uh, a typical day here or attracts my sleep it tracks my activities it works by the way with apple health so anything recorded in the apple health app is also visible so i want to show you the whole deal here so you see here it shows it gives me a readiness score this is based on a number of things not just sleep but things like heart rate variability it turns out the more variability in time between your heartbeats, the better. We're talking in microseconds, this tiny variation. But you can actually see what that is. You get a sleep score, and that sleep score is a lot of stuff. What kept you up, what your what your time, your latency getting to sleep was. Like, let, me, uh, let me go see some of my trends here. My bedtime trends, daily, weekly, and monthly, so you know... <laughs> 
oh, I've been getting later and later as time goes by. Uh, how much time you spend in deep sleep. And this is an interesting insight that you get. The more you exercise, the more I exercise, the longer my deep sleep is. Things like temperature, where you wouldn't even think uh, that would be important, but it turns out it is. In fact, these little micro variations in my body temperature are really important overall for uh, my health. Let me go back to trends here. To overall for my health. So I'm going to go to the ready, readiness section. And I can see over the last 30 days variations in body temperature. When it's getting a little higher, like right here, I'm getting a little sick. Now, that would, that is less than a one-degree differential, but it's enough to notice. And they have lots of information about what these insights mean. This is great. The heart rate variability is fascinating. Uh, again, higher is better. So I was doing better in October than I am this month. i got to work on that. All of this is tracked easily and instantaneously in the ring which is great because the ring is lightweight it's titanium it's waterproof it's got a diamond like carbon coating so it's light strong and completely non-allergenic i wear it in the bath in the shower in the hot tub when i swim you wear it all the time and unlike a watch or anything else a fitness band uh, wearing a ring to bed, for me at least, is, is a very easy thing to do. That doesn't bother me. You get bedtime guidance, sleep quality measurements, sleep stage tracking, so you know how much time you spent in REM, how much time you spent in deep sleep, light sleep. Um, <clears throat> Georgia would love this, your sleep trends. Yes. You get all sorts of readiness insights on your resting heart rate. By the way, my resting heart rate's very good, I'm glad to say. Heart rate variability. You get uh, activity insights. For instance, it'll tell me today be a good day to work out hard or you might want to take it easy today. Daily feedback really helps you understand your body, improve your health, reach your goals. It's very light. You can't tell by looking at it, but it's lighter than a conventional ring because it's titanium. They've got the heritage shape or the balance shape. <clears throat> you can get them in silver, black, stealth. They even have diamond. If you, uh, if you have a fancy lady you want to give a diamond ring to, they have a diamond version as well. That'd be a great engagement ring. It lasts up to one week, charges very fast, can store a couple of months of data so you don't have to. And by the way, it just, it just as soon as you open the Aura Ring app, it pairs with the phone. It's already paired. It's a Bluetooth LE, so it'll start downloading immediately. So it's very easy to download the data, but you don't have to do it every day. I am a big fan. We've got, uh, let me see, I can show you some of these actually. We have some Auras in different uh, colors and shapes. We could save you $50 off your purchase when you use the offer code TWIT. But these are flying off the shelves, and they are now back ordered through April. So don't wait. If you if you order today, there's the titanium kind of. That's kind of like my black one. It's very uh, very simple. Um, let me uh, get this one open. This is the Heritage Silver. They, by the way, there's no. It, it charges on a little stand. In fact, you'll see this when I open it up. This is the stand that it charges on. You just put that on your bedside table, and it just goes right on there and charges. So there's nothing to connect. Uh, this is the silver one. That's quite pretty. I don't think they sent us a diamond one. <laughs> and if they did, Lisa's already, already taken it. You'll get a free sizing kit, so you get it exactly with the right size for your finger, which makes it also very comfortable. It is There is no location tracking, if that's what you're worried about. And your information is absolutely private. Oh, this is pretty. I haven't seen this one. This is the... Kind of the, the uh, shiny black, the piano black. Very nice. Aura is spelled O-U-R-A. O-U-R-A. So it's AuraRing.com. Don't forget that offer code TWIT for $50 off. And you want to get it in time for uh, April, uh, which is the next batch coming in. They make them in Finland. By the way, I really want to emphasize this. It's a Finnish company. They make them in Finland. But also they have they are uh, adhere to the privacy and security laws of Finland, which means GDPR and everything. This is absolutely private and secure. They really do a good job, and I have compared it with every other sleep and fitness tracker I have, and it is absolutely the most accurate. It really is good. It's Aura Ring O U R A R I N G dot com. Use the offer code TWIT at checkout. Fifty dollars off your purchase. You might say, "Well, I'm going to wait till April when they're available." They will be sold out in April. Order it now if you want to get it in April. I just, just from my own experience, uh, these things are really, really flying off the shelves. And for good reason. This is easily the best fitness tracker I've ever used. AuraRing.com, offer code is TWIT. Time for our picks of the week. I shall let Lori Gill kick us off. Lori? Okay, so I'm going to London next week. <gasps> I'm and so jealous. because of that, this is the first time I've flown more than six hours. And I'm 
totally worried about how uncomfortable I'm going to be. So I bought myself an infinity pillow. What? Now, I haven't used it <laughs> on an airplane, but I've tested it out here at home. It's um, it's a pillow, but it's more like an infinity scarf. It's just this big. Oh, this is poof. so much better than those things you wear around your neck. Yeah, this you is can, good. You can use it in a bunch of different ways. Um, I I am the kind of person who will just sort of let my neck fall forward and fall asleep. Yeah. So you can make it so that the the meat of it is right here, so your chin won't fall. Huh. Or you can make it looser so that it kind of cushions you here or there. You can wrap it around your arm and use it while you're leaning against the windowsill. You can um, like put it on your arm so that it can be a pillow when you're on your desk. Um, you can use it uh, for a little bit of um, noise canceling or eye uh, light masking. I haven't tried those features because I'm not I'm not on a plane, so I'm not sure how good they are. But I love the variety of this. You can do so many different things with it. And if you are if you're a traveler, uh, you probably have fallen asleep on a plane or tried to fall asleep on a plane and realized how uncomfortable and difficult it is. I've woken up with drool down my face. So you embarrassing know, when that arm happens. Arm fallen yes. asleep because I'm leaning against the wall. So I, I'm hoping the infinity pillow is going to do the job for me. And I have messed around with it at home, just sitting on the couch, or I've used it as a um, lumbar support while I've been just sitting here at work and it works for that. So even if I, even if it doesn't help me sleep on the plane, it's already a benefit to me that I've been able to use it just at home. I'm ordering two right now. <laughs> I am. Cause this, <laughs> one, this, for, <laughs> we need, one for me, one for Lisa. This is totally what we need. It's, it's great. Yeah. What were you going to say, Renee? One for my back, one for my butt. <laughs> No, but that was way funnier than anything I could come up with, which is why I stopped my <laughs> one, sentence. I was just one for each head? Is that what you were going to say? All right. You are not a Dutrio, Leo. <laughs> I, it could be a Dutrio. Oh, a little Pokemon Go humor. <laughs> Andy Anako, your pick of the week. Uh, well, uh, we, we, a couple of weeks ago, we were talking about one of my favorite tipples, the Pepsi uh, 1893, oh, yes. uh, which is the made with real sugar and really nice spices and flavors. And it was it's the only sugared or really sweetened drink that I keep in the house because it's like my special treat. Uh, and a lot of people were really excited about it and started asking me where they can get it. Uh, and that's when I discovered that just a few weeks ago, Pepsi discontinued this what? product. So you can't get it anymore. And How I won't be dare it they? I, I I would pour I would pour one out for uh, for <laughs> but for it. But I've of course drunk every single last drop that I have, and now I'm looking at now I'm every time I'm in a supermarket or passing by a supermarket, I'm like let's drop by and see if they have any Pepsi 1893. So. Nothing gold can stay, Pony Boy. Nothing gold can stay. Apparently, <laughs> I, I, I told the universe that there is something that gives me a small amount of joy, and the universe said, Andy doesn't deserve even a small amount of joy. Or maybe they said that Andy's close enough to diabetes as it That's is. That's maybe what they were saying. Maybe we, maybe we shouldn't kill Andy with his daily dose of sugar and caffeine. We. <laughs> <laughs> so, so beverage beverage manufacturers, including at the big uh, beverage uh, manufacturing districts of Shenzhen, uh, I now have an opening for a new <laughs> office sweet tipple. If you'd like to buy that sponsorship, I'd I'm I, I feel as though I'm ethically forbidden to accept uh, spon paid sponsorships for anything tech related. But if you want to, if you want me to like Instagram like me pressing your product against my face <laughs> and saying how much I how much I love it. Oh, wait, so, how many CL cases do you have in you know back stock? Uh, I have zero, Leo, uh, <gasps> because it's it, again, it's 12 cans a month. And I was down to like maybe my last can by the time I found out about last week and got the notice from Amazon that oh, we're having MG. problems fulfilling this item. And now and even now, if you go on Amazon, you can buy a 12 pack for $60 instead of $14. And oh, I'll wow. be fine. I'll be fine. The speculators really jumped on that one right away. Yeah. And I was like, great, $60, $60 for what's going to be a case of stale soda. Oh, <laughs> I'm sure been drunk a month ago. It's eh, Anyway. Wow. Oh, well. So I just wanted to let, I wanted to share my pain and let people know, please stop looking for Pepsi 1893 and stop asking me where, where I can find it because if I'm finding it, I'm like Elaine with those contraceptive sponges. Like I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm there'd be a closet with just nothing but Pepsi 1893. If uh, I'm finding it someplace, I'm buying it for less than $60. Well, 
Lori, I just bought two of those infinity pillows, by oh, the way. That's great. I hope you <laughs> like you. them. I, I already like the one that I got and I haven't even flown anywhere. So I hope you like it. It's, I think it's great. No, I, it's yeah. a, I, you know, those neck pillows never did it for me because I like you. I sleep like this. Mm -hmm. And so yeah, that it's sounds that perfect. knot in the middle there. That's, that's what, also, what made me. Also, it's more flexible because like I like to put it up against the, if I have a window seat, I will sleep on the window. So having that ability is very nice for me. Yep. Oh, look, we <laughs> found some, uh, some, some Pepsi for you on eBay, <laughs> Andy. Only a hundred and nine dollars for yeah, twelve ounce cans. That's, again, this, this, this isn't this isn't wine or whiskey. It doesn't get better the longer it ages. But wait, it's the last it. one, Andy. It's the last one. Yeah. I I I see. I I better get used to not having it in my life or as early as possible. <sighs> I don't know why, but uh, eBay has categorized it under household supplies and cleaning vacuum cleaners. <laughs> it is, it is household Pepsi supplies as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> but vacuum Where's cleaner. Where's the Pepsi 2093? Oh, the future of Pepsi. That's the vanilla Pepsi, which is the now cola of the future. Yeah, see, back that, that, on that's shelves. What gets, that's what gets me angry. They got cherry, diet cherry vanilla Pepsi, which <laughs> no one who loves themselves will buy and drink voluntarily. <laughs> no one with any self-respect would ever buy that. Especially if you could get and all the, the sugar. The 800 number for the Samaritans on the on the on the side of the label because you have clearly given up. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm bitter. I'm bitter. I'm bitter. Um, my pick is ridiculous, but since Alex Lindsay isn't here, I thought I should pick up the mantle of the high-priced spread. <laughs> o OWC uh -oh. has announced the version 2.0 with their Thunderblade. I've always, you know, if you've got a Thunderbolt 3 port, most MacBook Pro, modern MacBook Pro and iMac Pro users do have, you want a Thunderbolt 3 drive, not some cheap USB 3 on a Type-C connector drive, not a Thunderbolt 2 drive. You want 2,800 megabytes a second. And uh, now you can get it in a very attractive, it even it apparently comes with its own Pelican case, a very attractive <laughs> Thunderblade. You know, it's actually not that expensive. Seven hundred ninety-nine dollars, eight hundred dollars. Let's make it eight hundred dollars for a terabyte. Um, eight terabytes, thirty-five hundred dollars. Now that's now maybe that's a little pricey, but uh, the portability and the beauty it's of this, so fast. and it's so fast. <laughs> I don't know. I don't have one, but I sure, I sure think that's a per. I bet Alex has a fortress of them. Yeah, I, I'm just <laughs> doing this for Alex to make him happy. It's just a, it's just one Alex for a terabyte. Come on. One terabyte per Alex. <laughs> One terabyte per Alex, exactly. <laughs> Renee Ritchie, your pick of the week. So uh, a lot of people know Guillermo Rambo from 9 to 5 Mac, where he does a lot of the interesting articles. But he's a developer, which is what allows him to do a lot of those deep dive, find the strings, discover the hidden icon sort of stuff. And his day job is making apps. And he's just released his new app, and it's called Ooh. Air Buddy. And the idea of this app is it's so easy to pair AirPods with your iPhone or your iPad. You get that little beautiful interface that comes up and shows you paired, connect, all of that. The Mac, you have to go to the menu bar like an old-fashioned animal and click on on it and, and choose the AirPods. So he made a version of the iOS interface for the Mac. It's five bucks. It was 10 bucks, but there were so many complaints. He dropped it down to five bucks. And now people are complaining. It's not 99 cents. And he responded, I what think, very I nicely say? saying, for <laughs> he responded very nicely saying for 99 cents, I just as soon sit there watching television and never make an app again. So it, five bucks, well worth it, less than you'd pay for a really large triple quadruple espresso. And you can enjoy it every day. Just seamless, very nice, very, very good integration for AirPods for Mac. And it also works with all people asked him where Beats Buddy was. And he said, it's the same app. As long as you have a W1 chip, this app will give you that that interface and let you enjoy your AirPods as elegantly as ever on your Mac. So nice. you can check that out. I think it's Air Buddy. That's like the link in the, in the notes, but I think it's AirBuddy dot something. AirBuddy. It's for you. It's your booty in the air. Just like that. It is. a pillow. Thank you, Renee stone. Ritchie. Go work. I'm more.com. Have you, have you received the email yet? Uh, it should be here in 13 minutes. <laughs> Good. We got you out in time. Uh, thank yeah. you so much for being here. You'll find, uh, of course, uh, Renee's coverage of Apple's quarterly earnings results in just a little bit of time at uh, imore.com. Also, his great podcast, Vector, at imore.com slash Vector, always a pleasure to have you on, Renee. So Good much. luck with that uh, that new uh, raid boss. What's it? What's its name? It's a weird looking one. Palkia it started. It started 13, 18 minutes ago. Leo, and haven't got one yet. Go get a Palkia. <laughs> Go get it. Gotta get them all. 
Yep. Lori Gill, we love having you on. Please come back real soon. She is, of course, at iMore as well, managing editor there, Appleholic. She, too, will be, I'm sure, listening with interest as Micah Sargent tippity taps away to the uh, analyst call coming up in just a few minutes. And we'll get you back here real soon. Thank you Thank so you. much. Lori, do you want to uh, plug a podcast, a, an upcoming performance, anything? We're playing on Wednesday night. At, Where? Uh, um, at the Cafe uh, Cafe Colonial or or the Colony. I can't remember which one. I think it's actually the Colony in Sacramento, California. If anyone wants to stop by and say hi. I so Has anybody <laughs> ever come from this show and said, Lori, no. I, not yet, huh? No, I, I met somebody at WWDC um, two years ago who listened to the I More show, which is the podcast that I, Renee and I do. Right. Um, and he said, I'm from Sacramento too. And that's the closest that I've ever come to making that connection happen. So <laughs> Let us fix that. Everybody go to the Cafe <laughs> Colony and watch Lori and her band, which is named? Uh, sick Burn. Sick Burn. <laughs> <laughs> Lori is bird. Lori is in front, right? Singing, mm -hmm. singing yep. her little heart out. You're just going to make fun of my hair, aren't you? <laughs> oh no! I'll just I'll put my arm around you and dance. If I weren't on my way to see Lady Gaga in Vegas, I would go see you instead. Oh, that's a much better performance, hands down. Oh, I doubt Don't worry, that. you're I, not missing out. I, I doubt not that. Not even a little. <laughs> uh, thank you so much, Lori. Come back soon. Thank it's you, at 3512 Stockton Boulevard, Sacramento, California. <laughs> Sick burn. Go see him at the Colony. Yep. Andy That's Anako, hear him on WGBH Boston every week. And, of course, at his website, ihnatko.com. He's also on Relay.fm with the Material Podcast featuring a yes. young lady known as Florence Ion. The amazing Flo Ion. The amazing uh, yeah, Flo my next show is uh, on GBH is Friday at 1230. And uh, if you're in the Boston area, we're going to be recording. We're going to be broadcasting live from the WGBH studio in Boston Public Library. Uh, so by all means, get a cup of coffee, get a cookie. You'll have to pay for both of those. Uh, but you'll be able to watch me as I pretend that the notes in front of me are things I'm just thinking of at that moment. <laughs> and if you really like Andy, bring him a case of Pepsi 1883. You, I'm, I'm saying that if you were <laughs> if you had one in the if, if you find one. One on the way, and you were to bring it with me, I will have an empty backpack with me. I'm just saying. <laughs> I wouldn't say no, he'd say. Thank if you, you have Andrew. a problem that can be solved by giving me Pepsi 1893, I'm more than happy to solve that problem for you. I'm, I'm feeling your pain. This guy's, you're going to, you know, he's going to have withdrawal soon. This oh, is terrible. again, the, 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 the heart, the, the, again, uh, loss and, and, and hurt is like uh, jagged rocks in a rock tumbler. As time goes by, those jagged edges get smoothed over and become beautiful gems. But right now I've got a chest full of tumbling broken rocks. That's oh. all. <laughs> we do Mac Break Weekly every Tuesday right after iOS today. Join us around 11 a.m. Pacific. That's 2 p.m. Eastern time. That's 1800 UTC. You can watch us live on the stream there's actually several streams, so best thing to do, go to twit.tv slash live, find the stream audio or video that best suits your needs. Uh, you can also, if people are saying, what happened to the Roku app? Roku changed its API. We did not update the app, So, but you can use YouTube Live's app. You can use Twitch's app. You can use Mixer's app. There are apps, uh, and we're on all three of those platforms, so uh, that'd probably be the easiest way if you want to watch on the Apple TV or the Roku TV. Actually, no, I take it back. There's a number of great apps on the Apple TV, none of which we did, but they're uh, all still active. So uh, just search for Twit on the Apple TV. Anyway, it's fun to watch live, but if you can't, on-demand audio and video also available after the fact for every show we do. The website's the place to go. That's twit.tv, in this case, twit.tv slash mbw, or fire up Overcast or Pocket Cast or whatever your favorite iPod program or podcast program is. And uh, subscribe, and that way you'll get Mac Break Weekly the minute it's available each and every week. Thanks for being here, and we'll see you next time. But meanwhile, get back to work. Because break time is over! Bye-bye! <laughs>